God's house worshiping with us this morning. Uh, today we are continuing our uh, series just kind of generally on the, the season of Advent in the church here as we look forward to Christ's second coming when he will come again to judge the living and the dead and bring his people home, we also remember and look back fondly on his, his first coming, his first coming to this world at Christmas. And today we rem- remember that we can, we can rest assured in the one who is coming, knowing that he brings joy with him. If you have a moment to locate one of those green connection cards in either end of the pew that you're sitting in, if you wouldn't mind filling that out uh, and putting that into the offering plate when that comes by you later on during the service, we would appreciate that record of your visit. Other than this, uh, just go ahead and take a moment to greet those worshiping with you today. All right, then we will begin with our first hymn, God Bless Your Hour of Worship. I'd invite you at this point to please stand if you are able. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given us his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, 
I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. your power, O Lord, and come. Protect us by your strength and save us from the threatening dangers of our sins. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. In our first scripture lesson today from Isaiah 64, um, we see that when, when God comes, when a just God comes, he always comes with justice in his hands. And, and that might sound like a lot of really bad news for us, because the reality is that all of us are sinners, that all of us have, have disobeyed God, that all of us have lived rebellious lives at points. And yet, we also know that this God comes with grace. And so, we pray for his mercy and for his forgiveness. We read, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you. As when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil, come down to make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. You come to the help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. But when we continued to sin against them, you were angry. How then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have given us over to our sins. Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be angry beyond measure, Lord. Do not remember our sins forever. Oh, look on us, we pray, for we are all your people. This is God's word. 
continue now with the children's message. I'd like to invite the young children forward. Good to see all of you here today. Okay, um, when, when you're riding in the car, right, and you come to where two streets cross each other, what do you often find there? We call that an intersection. What do you often find at the intersection? Cars. A stop sign or maybe a stop light, right? And so when you see that stop light and the light turns red, what do you expect the cars that are approaching that stop light to do? Okay, they should stop, right? The sign changes, and you expect that this means people are going to stop, right? How about when then you're sitting there in the line of cars, and the light turns green? What do your parents do? They go, right? As long as they're not looking at their cell phones, right? They go. The light turns green, and then a moment later, people start to move, right? One thing happens, and when that thing happens, you know that another thing is going to happen right after. Well, today Jesus tells us that he is going to give us signs, signs that we will see in the world around us that mean something is going to happen. We will see things like war and natural disasters and people becoming more and more wicked. And what does this mean is going to happen? What does this mean is going to happen? Sin. Okay, sin is, yes, sin is going to happen, and sin causes a lot of those things. But when we see these signs, it means that Jesus is going to come soon, right? When this thing happens, when the signs happen, we know that Jesus is going to keep his promise to come back for us, to come back for his people. Jesus already actually came once, didn't he? Yep. When did he come? Uh, Back. In the 9th century? Even before that, he came at Uh, Christmas. Christmas, Christmas. yeah, we're about to celebrate Christmas, right? Uh So Jesus came at Christmas. He came to live a perfect life for us. He came to die on the cross for us. He came to rise from death for us so that all our sins would be forgiven and so that we will have the assurance of eternal life. And just like Jesus came that time, he promises us that he is going to come again And that when he does, he's going to do what? That when we see Jesus, what does that mean? Is going to happen very quickly for us? We're going to go to heaven. We're going to be with him in eternal life. That's what we have to look forward to. And so when we see these signs around us, yeah, some of them might seem a little bit scary, but actually, what do they mean? They mean that soon, Jesus is going to come and bring us home. So let's fold our hands and we'll say a prayer. Lord God, thank you for giving us the signs around us to remind us that Jesus is coming again. Help us always to trust with strong faith in him, in his sacrifice on the cross for us, and in his resurrection, so that we will have the assurance that we will be with you in eternal life. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining me up here. Enjoy the rest of the service and the rest of this snowy day. As we look at our, our second lesson here today from 1 Corinthians, um, we, we see God's goodness in, in simply keeping us safe from the, the spiritual harms and dangers around us so that we know and can have the confidence that when he comes again, that he is going to find us blameless, not because of our own wonderful lives that we've lived, but blameless through our faith in Jesus Christ. We read, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. 
God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. This is God's word. We'll continue now confessing our Christian faith using uh, the ancient words of the Nicene Creed, which Christians around the world have confessed together for centuries. Please join me. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We'll continue with our next hymn. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, now and forever. Amen. I've got no snappy introduction for you today, and that's simply because uh, I want the, the, the powerful picture to speak that we find in our first couple of verses from Mark 13, from our Mark 13 reading today, where Jesus, speaking to his disciples, says, at that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory, and he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, 
from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. I mean, just, just imagine it for yourself. You're going about a totally normal day, maybe driving to work in the morning, navigating through one of the aisles at the grocery store with your shopping cart, pushing your kid on the, on the swing at the park, and, and then it happens, rocking you like a, like a thunderclap on a totally clear day. But this is no storm beginning to brew up in the skies, no. It's him, the Son of Man, coming upon the clouds. And he isn't alone, no. He's attended by all the angel armies of heaven there to do his bidding. The first time that Jesus comes to us at Christmas, when he comes as that baby in Bethlehem, he comes very humbly and, and quietly, right? He's not attended by great fanfare. Only a handful of people know even about his arrival. A few shepherds, his mom, his earthly father. He's not laid in some royal crib with silk sheets. No, it's just a quiet little manger. But the second time he comes, that's going to be quite different. When he comes again, it will be with all power and glory and, and a public authority that even the staunchest of atheists cannot deny. And yet, Jesus here is speaking these words to disciples, to those who know him and love him and trust in him. And for those people, Jesus knows that, that this time of waiting can, can seem so very, very long at points, right? Just as was the case, in fact, for those Old Testament believers waiting for the first coming of the Messiah, of their, their Savior, right? Going all the way back to Adam at the beginning and then to Abraham and, and Moses and David. Sometimes it must have seemed like, like maybe he wasn't going to come at all as they waited and waited for thousands of years. And Jesus also knows that for believers living in, in the New Testament era, that perhaps that waiting can be even especially more difficult because we live during what we might call the end times. If you would rewind a little bit here in Mark 13, you'd see Jesus still speaking to his disciples, listing off all these different signs of the end that we should expect to see in the world around us. And I got to tell you, they don't sound like very pleasant things. Jesus speaks of great wars, of famines and, and natural disasters, the hatred of the godless against the godly and what seems to be the reign of sin over creation. Just as holding your hand on a hot stove for five seconds can feel like an eternity, Jesus knows that, that waiting in a world so violent and ruinous and selfish as this can also feel like an eternity sometimes, to the point that we might start to ask those questions is Jesus really still coming back at all? I mean, come on, it's been 2,000 years. Why are we still waiting? And that's why Jesus assures disciples, as certainly as God's promises to send the Messiah the first time around were fulfilled, so also God's plans for the Messiah's second coming are inevitable in their fulfillment. Here's our first key point today. Rest assured, disciple, the Son is coming. And when he does, it means very good news for us, very good news for his chosen, right? He says that he's going to send all those angels out, and what are they going to do? They're going to gather his people, wherever you might be, wherever they might find you, even if that's six feet below the surface of the earth, they're going to raise you up, scoop you up, and gather you to his side. And yet, in these verses today, we also find a lot of words that are worth some very serious consideration on the part of God's people. And that's what we're going to explore more as we move along here. Jesus says, now learn this lesson from the fig tree. 
As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Okay, here Jesus is just speaking to the natural ability that people have to make deductions based on one thing happening that another will happen, right? When you see A, you can also expect B, right? When I was A, eating my Thanksgiving turkey, I knew that the next day, B, the radio waves were going to be filled with all kinds of Christmas music. When I open my refrigerator and peel apart a string cheese wrapper, A, I know also that B, the dog is going to come running in about three seconds for his cut of it, followed shortly probably by Violet. <laughs> and so here we have one of these, you see A, you're also going to then see B types of situations. Jesus says, even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near right at the door, right? So if we're following Jesus' train of thought here, when we see these signs of the end times, A, we also know B, that the Son of Man will come and will come soon. Truly I tell you, Jesus says, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Now, here in these verses, Jesus says something that, that maybe perplexes some people. Um, they, they see Jesus saying, this generation won't pass away until it all happens. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't know anybody that's 2,000 years old. Certainly, everybody that was alive at Jesus' time has now passed on. So what's the deal with this? Well, it's worth understanding that when you see that phrase, this generation, in, in the Greek language that the New Testament was written in, this didn't strictly mean a group of people born and living around the same time, the way that we typically use that word generation today, right? We've got our baby boomer generation, our millennial generation, our Gen Zers. That phrase, this generation, can also very commonly refer to a group of people who hold something in common. And so probably the best way to understand this, this generation, is as a reference to those people who hold a common rejection of God, of those who persist in their rebellion against him and in their unbelief of the one that he has sent. So while Jesus says that the elect, that his chosen ones, will be gathered to his side, he also points out that the rebels, although they endure to this time, they will pass away. Those who want nothing to do with God and nothing to do with the son that he sent will not be with him in the new heavens and the new earth that God has in store for his people. So here's our second key point today. Rest assured, disciple, this generation will meet its end. Those who persist in destroying the earth, there is a time of comeuppance that is just over the horizon. For those who oppress and harass God's people in ways both overt and sometimes in ways that are very, very subtle, for those who persist in their selfishness, their arrogance, their violence, their, their wickedness, God says that there is going to be a time of reckoning. And yet, there is also a very serious, um, a fair warning, and also a, a great encouragement in these verses and in the ones to follow for the disciples of Jesus. Okay, so let's explore this a little bit further, just looking at the next couple verses for now. Jesus says, but about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. Now understand when Jesus says that, that even the Son doesn't know, he is speaking as one who is still in his, what we sometimes refer to as his state of humiliation, meaning that Jesus, when he left heaven's throne and humbled himself for his work of redemption on this earth, he set aside the full and constant use of his divine abilities and divine knowledge, including that knowledge of when this last day will be. Jesus now in his resurrected and exalted state certainly knows when that day is. And yet the effect for us remains the same. If the angels don't know when that day is, 
if even Jesus didn't know when that day would be while he walked on this earth with us, we cannot know when that day is either. We do not know when that day is. And so we must always be on guard, Jesus says. We must always be alert. You see, Jesus knows that disciples living among the people of this generation have a great many dangers presented to them. Lures that that this generation and Satan will use to try and entice his people away from their faith and hope in Jesus, as well as dangers that exist within our own sinful hearts. Sometimes the the, the lure that this generation presents is simply in the the fact that it wants us to, to look for heaven while we are on this earth, right? A generation that says, why wait? Why have tomorrow what you could have today, right? Go ahead and and, and do whatever it takes to chase down those dreams. Do whatever it is that that feels good to you. A generation that will often try to convince us even that, that this is all there is, these 70, 80, 90 years, and so you might as well make the most of it while you can. You might as well have as much heaven as possible here and now. When that doesn't work, this generation will then often try to apply pressure to us. Pressure in which they are trying to bring about conformity from God's people. A generation that will say, why be different? Right? Why, why continue to endure the scorn of your coworkers, sometimes your family, your friends? I mean, wouldn't it be better just to, just to fit in? to do as the world does, to believe as the world believes, to just go with the flow, then we wouldn't have to be so mean to you all the time. Jesus also knows, too, that that our hearts are simply prone to a lot of spiritual apathy and sleepiness, especially when that waiting does seem very, very long. That as we endure things during these end times, it It's so tempting for us to just throw in the towel. Yeah, right, if Jesus hasn't come back yet, he must have forgotten about us. He's not coming back at all. And doesn't all that stuff sound a little bit too good to be true anyway? Jesus knows the dangers that this generation and our own sinful heart pose to disciples, which is why he insists upon maintaining that constant readiness, constant vigilance. And he then goes on to illustrate this with a short parable that we find in our last group of verses today. He says, it's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. And the point of Jesus' parable is very obvious, isn't it? There is to be no spiritual napping for his people. We don't let our faith take a break so that we can spend a time indulging ourselves with the things of this world. Even if we do have the intention to get our act together a little bit later on. Right? Jesus simply loves you and me too much to want us playing that kind of spiritual Russian roulette with our everlasting souls. Which is why he says to you and me and says to everybody, please don't let me come back and find you unprepared. And we've already looked at that, that serious admonition, those lures that, that are that are this generation presents to us. And yet in these verses, I also don't want you to be unaware of a very serious blessing that God gives us. You see, this whole idea of not knowing when Jesus is coming back is actually the very best thing that God does for us in these regards. Maybe I'll share a story with you and then, and then tie this together. Um, but when I was little, 
when I was a, a pretty small kid, whenever Uncle Cart and Aunt Lois were coming to visit, it meant a day of me and my siblings waiting by the front window. Now, this was a time and an age before cell phones were a thing, and Uncle Cart and Aunt Lois were rather free-spirited in their travels. And so while we knew probably, probably, what day they were coming, we didn't know what time, right? They might show up mid-morning. They also might show up when we're brushing our teeth about to go to bed at night. You just didn't know. But we did know that whenever they came, they were going to be bringing something really cool for me and my siblings, maybe a new present, maybe a basket full of candy. We didn't know exactly when. We didn't know exactly what. We knew, though, that it was going to be good. And so we waited glued to the window in anticipation. Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, remember the one who is coming back. And perhaps the best way to remember that master who is coming back is by remembering the one who already came. That master, the Savior, who came to us already at Christmas, right? When he came, he brought love for the loveless and hope for the despairing. It's the same Savior who brought grace upon grace and stood as the embodiment of truth amidst all the lies of this generation. He's the very same master whose conduct in life, whether in word, in Indeed, all the way down to the attitudes of his heart was totally perfect and absolutely pure in order to cover over all of our failures, all of our sin, all those times that we have given in to the things and indulged ourselves in the things of this generation. He's one and the same Savior who then made himself the sacrifice to pay that full price to pay the full punishment that our sins justly deserved. It's the same master who then rose from death in order to give us that assurance that his sacrifice was the power to cancel guilt and also that he holds in his hands the power of resurrection for our own bodies. Jesus already came once at Christmas, that baby born in Bethlehem, and he says that he is coming again, and that when he does, he is bringing with him unimaginable joy. I think of what Jesus said in another one of his parables about the end times, one that we actually read a couple weeks ago, when that master comes back and finds the faithful servant, what does he say? Come and share your master's happiness. It means that we now, each and every day, because we don't know when he is coming back, that we wait with this electric anticipation and excitement for that day, keeping our eyes fixed on the heavens, not fixed down here, so that our hearts would turn to, to the dull poisons and base loves of this generation so that we might dare, so that we would dare not settle for any lesser master. But so that just as my siblings and I waited with that anticipation for, for Uncle Cart and Aunt Lois, we also look with anticipation for his second coming, waiting and watching faithfully for his coming upon the clouds. Rest assured, disciple, those who wait faithfully will be delivered to joy. When you see that tree in the springtime budding, you know that soon it will pop and flower with life. So also we see these signs. And when we do, we take heed. We keep watch. We keep awake because we know what they mean. That Jesus will come again soon. And with him, the fullest flourishing of life beyond anything we have ever experienced before at his side and in the arms of our Father. Perhaps we can end today 
with the words of Jesus, who I think said it best in Luke 21, verse 28. When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Amen. We will continue now gathering our thank offerings. Uh, again, if you have that green connection card filled out, please put that into the offering plate as that comes past you. Thanks. In our prayers this morning, uh, we will offer up a prayer of thanksgiving for all the work of Bethany's service team and for all of those volunteers who assist with so many things here at Bethany, both at this campus and at our other one. After uh, this prayer, we will uh, raise our voices together with the Lord's Prayer. Lord God, as you sent your Son once, we know that he will come again. We ask today for your continued mercy in our lives so that none of us would ever fall into spiritual apathy or be dragged away from our faith by the lures of this generation, of Satan, or of our own sinful hearts. Protect us from every spiritual attack, keeping us strong in our faith and hope as we remain ever vigilant for that Savior who redeemed us from all unrighteousness and who promises us that he will return to gather us and bring us to our everlasting home. Heavenly Father, thank you also for the many gifts and abilities you have given to Bethany's members. Thank you also for the, for the spirit you have poured into their hearts by faith, who has moved them to use their time and talents to encourage each other and build up this gospel ministry. We ask that you would continue to fill all our people with the spirit of service, so that together the body of Christ on this earth, your church, would become stronger through it. Help us all to offer our appreciation to those who serve us so that they too would be encouraged and so would serve ever more diligently in your kingdom. These things we pray in Jesus' name and we also join together in the prayer he taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, whose way John the Baptist prepared when he called people to repentance and pointed to Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
We give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. He endures forever. O God the Father, source of all, in your loving kindness, you sent your Son to share our humanity. We thank you that through him you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. We also pray that you will not forsake us, but will rule our hearts and by your Holy Spirit, so that we willingly serve you day after day. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. We'll sing our closing hymn.